Does sunlight help prevent Alzheimer's from all the vitamin D? It's ironic that we work in California and we check all kinds of vitamins and, and about 10% of our patients have vitamin D deficiency. So because people don't just, they don't go out anymore or they put too much sun, sunscreen and they should put sunscreen, but sometimes uh, too much and, and we're not getting, uh, but it's mostly because people don't leave home as much, especially elderly. Vitamin D deficiencies is, is one of the things that we're seeing associated with many neurological diseases. MS is one of them, multiple sclerosis. Dementia is potentially one of them. It's at very beginning stages, so we can't you know, expand on it too much. But there seems to be an association. And whenever we see vitamin D deficiency, we definitely tell the patients to supplement uh, and, and also go out more and get more sun because it's good for you. And regardless of the vitamin D deficiency association with sunlight, sunlight in itself, especially uh, being exposed to sunlight earlier during the day, uh, sets your circadian rhythm. Uh, people actually tend to sleep much better um, later during the day if they get exposed to the sun first thing in the morning. Um, one of the best things we can do for our brain health is a brisk walk in the morning. That way you get exposed to the sun, so the sun activates the circadian rhythm. You get melatonin secretion that will actually make you sleepy during the night. And also, you know, starting your day with a great exercise, stretch your circulation, I think it's one of the best things that one can do to uh, stave off diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Why are Alzheimer's rates increasing? There are several reasons. One is the aging of the population. <clears throat> the fastest growing population in America are those 85 and above. Four times faster than 65 and above who are twice as fast as everybody else. They're growing. In fact, right now we have 80,000 centenarians in the United States. That number is expected to go to 600,000 by 2050 if we don't have any other cures. And we know we will, so there's going to be much bigger. So aging. Now, does, does that mean that if you age, you, you're expected to have dementia? At this point, yes. Without the lifestyle interventions that we're, we're not instituting, yes. At age 65, about 10% of the population is expected to have dementia. And it doubles every 10 years thereafter. And by 85, nearly 50% are expected to have dementia. And they do. And uh, <clears throat> Alzheimer's being the, the main type. Now... Is, is that a foregone conclusion? Absolutely not. We, we know that if you institute lifestyle factors, <clears throat> that number can be significantly lower. So it's not correlated directly with age because at this point we're not doing anything with aging. So that aging component is a factor. And our cumulative trauma as we get older is another factor. As we get older, we don't do anything about the blood pressure, at least not the underlying factors. We just keep taking medicine. We don't do anything about cholesterol, which actually becomes more and more. We just take more medicine. We don't do anything about diabetes or prediabetes, and we just give it medicine. So that's why there's cumulative damages as we get older. So all those factors have to do with the greater risk for Alzheimer's as we get older. And what can reverse all that? Earlier institution of lifestyle factors. Then it's not, then it doesn't have to be an age factor. Do we have any control over preventing Alzheimer's? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, people get to hear the myth that Alzheimer's cannot be prevented. Um, Alzheimer's can't be treated. That's, that's for sure. We don't have any treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, billions of dollars have been spent over the last few decades on focusing on the wrong model of Alzheimer's disease. We always tend to focus on the end products at the latest or the last stages. Amyloid proteins here, for example, is a protein that accumulates in, in the brain during the later stages. But that's a downstream product of everything that has happened earlier on in life. Alzheimer's can be prevented. We've actually seen it in population studies. We've seen it in our own clinic in patients who come in with mild cognitive impairment, which is the earlier stage of Alzheimer's disease. And if lifestyle, uh, a lifestyle intervention is instituted, we see reversal of some of the damage and doesn't let them go down that route. Absolutely can be prevented. I think the misunderstanding is because uh, people always confuse treatment and prevention. 
we, we never have claimed that we can treat Alzheimer's disease at this stage, no. When that happens, the brain has already gone through the stages of its damage and it can't be, but reversal, uh, but, but when it comes to prevention, absolutely, we see it all the time. What are the most important things we can do to prevent Alzheimer's and what proof is there that they really prevent it? <clears throat> I think the most important thing we can do because it's a personalized disease. It's not a one path disease. Some people come to it from inflammation. Some people come to it from glucose dysregulation. Some people come to it from fats and lipid dysregulation. It's multiple directions. It's personalizing it. Finding out what are your risk factors and affecting those. That's why it's good to get the testing. It's a common, you know, do you have uh, uh, insulin resistance or diabetes? Do you have cholesterol? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have risks for those things? Do you have, you know, have you had head trauma? Do, you know, other kind of factors that have put you in that path. And if so, then do the things necessary to reverse those risks. And ironically, what are the things you can do to reverse those risks? Nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, and mental activity. That's why our acronym is NEURO, N-E-U-R-O. Nutrition, uh, exercise, unwind for stress management, R for restorative sleep, not just sleep. You can knock people out, but they might not be getting restorative sleep. And O is for optimizing mental activity. And if you do those things, absolutely you will reverse it. And each person has to decide where they're picking their battle first. If somebody has sleep apnea, which means that they're not getting enough oxygen at night, for them, they could eat a truck full of kale. It's not going to do any good. They should start their battle with sleep apnea. For others who are not getting any mental activity and social activity, they could be eating all the healthy food and exercising, but no social and mental activity. That's going to damage them. For others, they have the social activity, but eating extremely poorly. Then that's the battle they should take. But everybody can take on this battle in their own way. And it's not that hard. And you don't have to buy anything from anybody because it's your personal lifestyle. And the concept of brain health is similar for all the other organs in the body. What we say is if you start taking care of your brain, you've taken care of the rest of the body. Um, the, the same concepts of you know, a whole food plant-based diet being good for the heart actually applies to the brain as well. Um, prevention, maybe even more. Maybe even more, absolutely, because it's a very, very vascular organ. We actually have more arteries in our brain than any other organ in the body. So how can it not be affected by lifestyle? And as far as data is concerned and research is concerned, you know, I don't think there's any controversy. We've known for decades and decades of what works for, for the brain and for the body. It's about getting rid of processed foods. It's about getting rid of saturated fats from meats and poultry and dairy products. It's about increasing a whole food plant-based diet as far as nutrition is concerned. And then the same thing for exercise, for stress management, for sleep, let me tell you about sleep. Sleep apnea, which is an epidemic, increases your chances of Alzheimer's disease by 70%. 70%. So, like Dean said, it's a personalized approach. If you have sleep apnea and you refuse to wear your CPAP machine because it's very uncomfortable, no matter how much you exercise, no matter how much you eat healthy foods, if you don't take care of that, that's not going to be helpful for your brain at all. So it has to be through a personalized approach.